What is Turkestron and how does it work? Is it even safe? The dose makes the poison. Does it even work or are you being misled and deceived by others trying to make a quick buck? To make that bottle of pills, I can guarantee you it is less than $10, possibly even less than $5 to make that. Now Turkestron is an anti-steroid because just like humans produce steroid hormones like estrogen and testosterone, plants and insects have their own anti-steroids. And that's why Turkestron is then also compared to other anabolic hormones like like Dianabol and testosterone because people think ectosteroids are the same as human steroids. But is this a fair comparison to make? The main difference is that insects have their own ectosome receptors where ectosteroids could bind to for example start molting, which is basically shedding skin. Humans for example have their androgen receptors where testosterone would bind to for example cause muscle growth. These two receptors are two different things. Insects don't have the androgen receptor and no human has that ectisome receptor. So... Unless you're molting, I don't think it's going to be that practical or that relevant for you. There is however one receptor where these ectisteroids for some reason do seem to bind in humans. But before we dig further into that we need to know how you can see if a supplement shows promising potential and then apply that to tocestrone. Because most people don't want to wait years for enough research to come out but also don't want to waste $10,000 on hyped up supplements. To answer this question I hopped on a call with Ben Escrow who owns a supplement company and because of his master's degree in pharmaceutical chemistry he has a very very good knowledge about how pharmaceutical companies with millions of dollars do their research and how supplements influence chemical processes in the human body. I'm trying to see if there's anything in the folk use of them that seems to line up with what I'm trying to do and then I will look to try to find either mechanistic papers or human trials to see if it validates and backs that up. And if there's no human one, I need at least a mechanism, either an animal or an isolated model to see this purified compound works definitively on this pathway. It either activates it or blocks it. And this is what happens. So we can focus on these three things folklore, human trials, and an established mechanism. First of all, we needed to find folk use for turkestrone, which comes from the plant Ajuga turkestenica. That's been around for a long time, but it's not used or hasn't been used to make jacked Pakistanian bodybuilders. That's where it grows. So that's the first checkbox crossed. Next, we've got the human trials. If you've already seen Jeff Nippert's video on this, you can skip this part and use the chapters down below. We only see to have two published studies on ectisterone, one quality study from 2006 and one more fake study from 2019. Now a key thing I want to highlight here is that these studies are done on ectisterone and not turkestrone, which is important because if ectisterone would work it wouldn't necessarily mean that turkestrone does the same thing. Now the 2006 study didn't see any significant difference in both muscle growth and strength gains and also important hormones like free and total testosterone, cortisol and more. The second human study from 2019 did see a significant difference but there are a couple of very big red flags in this study. First of all to measure muscle mass they used bioelectrical impedance. This is a very inaccurate way to measure body fat percentage and secondly but most importantly they tested afterwards if these supplements contained the right dosage of ectosterone, but when testing it they found that instead of 100 milligrams it only contained 6 milligrams, meaning that the dose was very very low and probably shouldn't even increase effects significantly. So there is a strong reason to believe that this was a false positive, which is not even that uncommon in muscle growth studies due to their small sample sizes. And the researchers did try to selectively put people with good and bad genetics together to normalize results, but this is heavily subjected to bias. You can't really look at somebody and say that's a hyper responder. You can guess based upon how muscular they are coming in and you know certain criteria, but it's still a guess. So basically because one person might respond better to resistance training, there is a chance that you accidentally put all of them together and will then also group the non-responders together. And thus you would see a difference because they naturally already would see different results. But only two studies is definitely not a reason to draw any strong conclusion. Now most science-based people will say 
that and wait because most of the time the new creatine eventually ends up being useless. But because there are no definite conclusions from the human trials, we can start looking at the mechanisms claimed behind it. Because Derek, the main person who started this, but also others mainly focus on this aspect while looking at animal studies. Now there are a number of animal studies with small sample sizes showing some anabolic effect of ectosteroids and torchesterone, but these are done by mostly the same Russian author who I like to think could have easily influenced results but that's heavy speculation and mostly a joke but even if something works in animals it a hundred percent for sure doesn't mean that it works in humans. There's enormous numbers of drugs that are effective in animal trials then you go to first in human and they just don't work and we're not talking about supplement industry budgets we're talking about five million to twenty million that pharmaceutical companies have dumped in a vested interest in launching this as a pharmaceutical. If you even look at this review, you can see that the effectiveness in translation from animal studies to humans is almost completely random, meaning you can't really use them to predict how humans will react. So if we do feel comfortable jumping down that rabbit hole of animal studies, we need an established mechanism behind why this does promote muscle growth. If we have that and we know how it should work about the same in humans, we've got something that could be promising. And I really need to emphasize this, this still doesn't mean that the mechanism works the same way in humans, it would still be a random guess and would require more research. Now some people claim that ectosteroids and more specifically turkestron work like steroids but without the nasty side effects like gyno, acne and so forth because they don't seem to bind to the androgen receptor like testosterone normally would. But this is the main reason why testosterone and other anabolic hormones would build muscle. So why the f would it give the same results? The whole story here is that ectosterone does seem to bind to another receptor called estrogen receptor beta or ER beta in short. Keep in mind this is not the same as the androgen receptor which is where most anabolic steroids that cause muscle growth would bind. In isolated cells it does seem to be the case that ectosterone and probably turkestrone does bind to ER beta but the thing is that turkestrone isn't necessarily that potent. Potent meaning that it's likely to bind to the receptor and cause a response. Ben even showed me that it's not really the case in computer models which aren't a hundred percent accurate but can still be interesting to look at. You can put in turkestrone and basically see the probability to what it's most likely to bind and you have to go all the way down to the 40th place to find the beta receptor. And if you look at the probability, even though I don't really have an exact number, you can see it's around 5% max. This means that the idea that turkestrone does bind to ER beta more effectively than any other substance could already be a stretch. But if we would know a hundred percent for sure that activating this receptor would even cause muscle growth, I would give it the benefit of the doubt. However, there is no clear evidence whatsoever that it does. To know if activating the ER beta receptor would have potential muscle building mechanisms, we can look at other agonists. Agonists simply being other substances that could activate the ER beta receptor like genistein or estradiol. All these agonists can basically do four things on a receptor. They can fully agonize it causing a full effect. They can partially agonize it, causing a smaller expected effect. They can be neutral, so no effect, but blocking the other agonists from binding. Or they can inversely agonize it, basically causing the opposite effect. That means that turkestrone, if it does bind, has to do one of these four things. And this in turn would mean that there probably should already be an existing mechanism where one of these substances that can activate the ER beta receptor would cause muscle growth. When looking at the research there are zero studies really showing that agonists like genistein and estradiol effectively cause muscle growth, especially in humans. How many people are stacking estrogen with their testosterone? Do you hear of any bodybuilders doing that? Like if there was really something there, don't you think people whose money and livelihood depended upon it 
would be stacking estrogen with their anabolics. This means that if Turkestron does effectively bind to the ER beta receptor and if a very very big if does promote muscle growth, this would establish a whole new mechanism via which estrogen receptors would cause muscle growth, which is highly unlikely. Substances that activate the estrogen receptor are known to play a role in bone health and muscle protection, but not really muscle growth. For example, this study in rats, which is already a red flag, does illustrate that when a muscle is damaged, the ER beta receptor plays a role in regeneration of that injured muscle. But this isn't the same as trying to grow a muscle by exercising it. So this study is not evidence that the ER beta receptor plays a role in actual muscle growth from lifting weights. So again, a very big stretch to make that claim that it does increase muscle growth. And even if a certain agonist can cause muscle growth, it doesn't mean that turkestron does the same thing. So as you can see, a lot of big jumps in conclusions, making it even less likely to cause muscle growth. So that's another checkbox crossed, which means turkestron probably doesn't show promising potential. But of course, we can almost never say with 100% certainty that something does not work because there is always a potential of finding some new mechanisms. We can just say that the probability is very, very low. So greedy influencers use this to say, well, there is not enough research, so you just don't know, but I'm seeing results in other people. But because all of them i'm going to prove why the anecdotal argument is trash and the mediocre results most people get is very very comparable to a placebo i remember people talking about ecti steroids when i first got into supplements 15 ish years ago so it just kind of keeps cycling you need to have the hype machine this is true they were becoming hyped up years ago and is the reason why the first study was actually done the study was funded by a grant from muscle tech a pretty huge player in the field and you know that they want these things to work. So I think that does speak a lot more volumes. To me, it says a lot that the anecdotal evidence wasn't even strong enough back then to continue research. But how strong is the placebo effect anyway? This study took 11 elite national level powerlifters and told them that they were given a fast acting steroid pill. They immediately improved their lifts by 4 to 5% on average, which for elite powerlifters is insane because that basically transfers to 50 to 100 pounds added to their totals. What they didn't know, however, is that they were in fact given a placebo pill. At this point, the researchers told five lifters that they were given a placebo. Not only was that group unable to hit new PRs, they in fact even lost their placebo gains and were unable to lift their placebo PRs. And the other six who still thought they were on steroids even hit new personal records. So you can see how effective the placebo actually is and this is basically the effect most people have when taking this supplement because they don't really report that big of a difference. I did feel like my workouts were slightly improved. And the results are minimal at best. It can help with strength. You're not going to grow muscle overnight. It's not like, man. Those are huge gains. Which means the difference they do report is most likely the effect of a placebo. There is a reason why there always needs to be a placebo group in a supplement study. You can give someone rice pills and they can get better gains than the group given nothing. But we can make even more arguments against turkestron. Let's consider the cost. One bottle easily costs around $60. And if you're taking two capsules a day, you're spending 60 freaking dollars a month on a supplement with almost no guarantee. Compare the cost of that supplement to a diet plan, coaching, creatine or a good training program, not even from me, but literally everyone else and you're going to see much more gains with a much higher guarantee that it works. Now if you have invested money in all the other things and you would like to be your own test subject, I'm really not going to try to stop you, but there are some things you should know. First of all, the 2019 study already shows that a lot of companies underdose their products and there is also another study showing the same thing in active steroid supplements. So you should know what to look out for. 
power. You should know that you're getting Turkestrone or active steroids. The best way to know that, look at the label. If it's being sold as like 90% or above, like a high purity active steroid supplement, it should be a white powder. It shouldn't be brown. It shouldn't really be off white. If not, you're not getting what you're told. When it comes to the safety of these dosages, there are also some crucial things to know. The dose makes the poison. Like you can take something extremely poisonous and toxic, and if you dose it small enough, it won't kill you. It's not toxic. You need to be careful with the knowledge that I said empty steroids are safe. They're safe at known dosages. We don't know if you double or triple that it's going to be safe. There is a low possibility that maybe you'll find something that we haven't yet, but there's also a high possibility that you're going to find something that you didn't want to find. One study did show that in smaller animals, extremely high doses weren't toxic, but we don't really metabolize things the same way a red does for example so we can say with a hundred percent certainty that it's safe at high doses now most reasonable dosages do seem to be safe but even something as simple as water is toxic when the dose is too high and especially plants which turkestrone comes from can be toxic once you start consuming too much but if you're looking to take more you need to be more intelligent about it especially if you experience any side effects it's safe to say that it would be smart to stop taking it and there are even some things that are smarter to do. You should have pre-blood work done and then blood work after a week or two of doing it. It's called a, a CMP, Complete Metabolic Panel. Be as safe as you can doing it. This does again add some costs, but you don't really want to take the risks when it comes to health. Now, on top of that, we don't know what the effective dosage would be if it would work. We need studies for that, so it's hard to say where the upper or lower limit is. So you're basically just taking a wild guess. You could be taking way too much and effectively spending more than triple the amount needed or you could do the exact opposite meaning that the chance of you wasting money is actually pretty high now if these supplement companies and influencers actually cared about your health money and the results you would get they could easily fund a study to find out what the dosages should be and how effective these supplements actually are. To make that bottle of pills, I can guarantee you it is less than $10, possibly even less than $5 to make that. I can tell you if we were making that larger profit margin, we would definitely be having someone study it. Until now, they've only used friends or clients to test it out, which is heavily subjected to placebo and bias. I highly recommend watching the full interview with Ben for more in-depth information, which will be linked in the description down below. Ben also made a detailed post on Instagram on why even promising ingredients don't always work, so make sure to check it out. You can also find more about him and his science-based supplement company right there. I couldn't have made this video without Ben, so very big thanks for that. Now, if you don't want to watch the interview, make sure to watch this video right now if you want to maximize muscle growth.